morning to introduce our first speaker, David Roseland, a pastor of Preston City Bible Church. First time I met David was about 13 years ago. I had just recently moved to Preston City, Connecticut. Actually, I was living in converted mill housing in the backwater of Norwich, Connecticut, called Baltic, Connecticut. And I got a phone call from this uh, young man who was just finishing his third year at the United States Military Academy at West Point. We had some mutual friends, and uh, he was told to come over and meet me. And uh, so I told him how to get there. And he said he would be there on, I think he came over on a Saturday, and he would be there around maybe 10 or 11 in the morning. Well, whatever his original transportation plans were, they fell apart. But I learned something about his character that day because he took a bus from West Point down into Manhattan and then took a train, I think, from there to New London, and then he took a cab. I don't know where you got the money, but must have mugged somebody. Took a cab from there up to the house, and all of that took him probably about six additional hours. But it showed his uh, perseverance, and it showed that uh, when he understood what the mission was, he got it accomplished. And uh, that weekend, we had a great time together, and he told me that he believed he had the gift of pastor-teacher, and he wanted to know what he needed to do in order to be prepared so that when he finished his military uh, ser service, that he could go to seminary and be a properly trained uh, pastor-teacher. And uh, I took him at his word, something that his mother did not do. Where is she? Hiding over here somewhere. Something that, there she is, something she didn't do. She told me that later. She said, you really believed in him. Well, I didn't have a reason not to. So uh, David has, he, he stuck to the course. He read what I encouraged him to read, listen to the people, tapes, other media, people I encouraged him to listen to, went to Dallas Seminary, completed a four-year program in three years, and uh, little did we know that he would be the pastor to follow me at Preston City Bible Church. So uh, over the years, we have had as a primary discussion the whole topic of sanctification, specifically uh, Lewis Berry Chafer's view of sanctification, the criticisms, critiques, evaluations, especially the Warfield evaluation. And so this is what he is presenting today is, I know because I've been studying this many years myself, is a work in progress but I'm really, I have a, two or three papers that are being given this week. This is one of them I'm, I'm really excited about and really uh, looking forward to hearing. So David, come up and uh, teach us. How's that? Okay. <clears throat> Let me say it again. Good morning. It's really a wonderful thrill to be with you here at uh, West Houston Bible Church for the Chaper Seminary Conference. Um, it's, uh, it's really neat. The more I study our history, um, and uh, that's what today is, is a, is a presentation of our history. Uh, it's, it's really neat to see where we stand. Um, this thing hasn't been going for very long, the Bible conference movement, but this is a direct, this meeting here, direct derivative of the, um, the historic Bible conference movement that popularized C.I. Schofield and Lewis Berry Chafer and um, uh, is distinct, though contemporaneous, with the Keswick movement in England. And um, so it's something you never thought you would, uh, first of all, know about. I never knew anything about this stuff. Nobody looks at this history much. In fact, I'm really interested in doing more research on it. Um, you never uh, thought you would even know about this, but then now that you know, you're like, this is an incredible blessing to just be part of this Bible conference movement. I have an artifact of, uh, of this uh, phase of history that um, is still with me. It was interesting to me. I'm pulling this out of my briefcase, and I said, I need this to come up there and do what I want to do this morning. Uh, it's my notebook. It's my spiral notebook. And um, if you're part of, uh, of what I'm part of, if you're from where I'm from, you probably have um, either a pile of these somewhere or you've, you've recently thrown them away but, uh, <laughs> because you're not going to read them. Um, <laughs> but uh, I can't think without a spiral notebook uh, for some reason. Um, anyway, 
Um, <clears throat> I went to Dallas Seminary, and I want to mention a couple of men um, that aren't here that want to be here, and uh, one of them I know for sure, well, actually both of them I think are watching online. Um, Clay Ward would be here today, and you know this, but he couldn't, and I just want to mention that. Keep them in prayer. They just had their fifth child, little Abigail, um, little, little girl, uh, eight pounds, I believe, seven ounces. And uh, that's why he's not here. But he had a paper. His, his paper was done and submitted and footnoted and correctly formatted, I think, like two weeks before mine was. And he's a father of four um, <laughs> who works at home. And I'm a father of two little kids, that, and, you know, two years old and, and uh, an 11-month-old. And, uh, and I think I'm busy. And, and I, was, uh, I was using that as my... Uh, wow, this is really hard to get this paper done and be a pastor. And, and, and Clay's a, uh, an abiding inspiration and friend. And uh, just keep Clay and Amy and the, and the kids in your prayers. Um, <clears throat> also, Todd Atwood, I don't know if you know Todd, and some of you know him. Todd Atwood is a 2007 uh, THM graduate of Dallas Theological Seminary um, in Bible Exposition. Um, and he was my, I like to say, my battle buddy in seminary. He's my brother-in-law. And uh, he's the pastor of Grace Bible Church of Rockwall, Texas. And um, please remember him in your prayers as well. Um, uh, Todd and I uh, had just such a wonderful time. I remember Robbie used to talk talks about his time with Tommy and, and his friends in seminary and how they, they kind of had a group that would sit around and talk and do the table talk thing. And uh, this is a seminary conference, and there are seminary students here. And I just want um, to, to share some of the richness of, of what happens. It, studying the Bible and studying in seminary sometimes are two different things. And... Um, it, uh, you got to you got to break it up with some humor. You really do. And um, uh, part of our legacy, really, here is is the ability to laugh at ourselves. And um, Todd and I would always do these word association games um, as we went through through classes. And uh, and uh, especially in in uh, Greek uh, syntax, there's all these labels that grammarians have put on the function of of an aorist tense. And you've got the consummative aorist and the and so we made up our own syntactical categories. And so like. Um, like um, the the, uh, the the second person plural, there's a texative second person plural. The y'all, uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's a texative use of the second person plural, and we we, we had all kinds of fun things. And I, I just I'm listening yesterday to, uh, to to this very difficult thing. Sanctification is as we've said but with sanctification and eschatology, the two hardest uh, things to nail down and be consistent in a in a um, an inductive approach that yields a systematic theology, which is what Chafer is, what Schofield was, what his books, what these books are trying to, to get to, what the framework is. It's an inductive approach that gives you a systematic theology which is not the same thing that you get out of Westminster, and that's what we're talking about today. Um, but, uh, but I'm listening to all these words and just all the, all the language, all the, all the vocabulary is coming out. And, and I can't help but keep playing this word association game, and I keep wishing Todd was here and I could, could rib and say, hey, the text of y'all anyway. Um, so I just wanted to share some word associations. I learned to do this from a, a man named David Reagan who speaks at Preacher every year. He's got a shtick he does where he puts up church signs. And so I, I play word associations. Really all jokes c- come down to that at some point. But anyway, um, so l- I'll give you a word and, and then I'll show you what comes up in my mind when, <laughs> when that word occurs. And we'll see if, if we can compare. <clears throat> I heard about Pentecostal yesterday. I used to go to class and say, well, we're not going to go be Pentecostals. That's J. Dwight Pentecost. Uh, he's, uh, I believe he's 95 this year. He might be 96. Um, no, okay, 97, 90. I remember we had a birthday party for him in class, and I think it was 93. It was 93rd uh, birthday in class one time, and um, just had a wonderful thing, a wonderful time studying with him. That, that was a real bright spot at Dallas Theological Seminary to go hear from a scholar who's a real dispensationalist. Uh, despite what uh, others might have come after him might say about his scholarship, um, as we heard last night. Um, <clears throat> I just uh, love Dr. P. We, they, they call him Dr. P. at school. And so we used to always joke about how we were Pentecostals between uh, 1.30 and, uh, and, you know, and, and 2.45 um, after lunch and uh, hear about uh, the life of Christ on earth. By the way, if you haven't read uh, The Words and Works of Christ, that's my one volume go-to on the Gospels, his, uh, his presentation of the Gospels. Um, and uh, really appreciate him for that. Heard about reformed. Reformed. What comes to your mind when you hear reformed? Well, obviously. Um, <laughs> I will make no remark. Speaking of a model, 
we talked about modeling, this theology. Have you ever thought in terms of model, different models of theology? I mean, it is uh, the doctrine of sanctification that will open some of your eyes that, that every doctrine has a different, like there's, there's a book that every seminary student reads called Models of Revelation by a Catholic uh, scholar, Avery Cardinal Dulles. Models of revelation, like how does God reveal? And there's all these different models that scholars can, can describe and abstract. And sanctification, you definitely, we keep talking about the Chafer model. I hear model, well, what comes to my mind when I hear model? An M1A2 <laughs> tank. That's the first right thing right away. Progressive. <laughs> you thought I was going to show a picture of Theodore Roosevelt. Spurious, well, it's, we're in Texas. It's the Houston uh, Livestock Show and Rodeo right now. Or as I like to think of it, the Chafer Conference, what, you know, what's going on in Houston right now. Um, <clears throat> we talked about a uh, famous theologian. But when I hear this name, I mean, come on. <laughs> MacArthur. MacArthur, you don't want to think lordship. You want to think there is no substitute for victory. I'm almost done. <laughs> Mystic. Well, I live in uh, eastern Connecticut. There's a sort of a resort fun town for ladies who go shopping, and their husbands eat ice cream called Mystic, Connecticut. And there you have it. Some of you have been there. If you haven't come to see us yet, then you will. go. We will uh, take you to the Mystic Drawbridge and to the Mystic Drawbridge ice cream shop. When I hear Mystic, I have to make the association that uh, somewhere, at some point, we need some ice cream. But, but I am from Texas, so the frozen chosen would be bluebell ice cream. So I'm going to give you a tale of two theologians today, and I, I said, well, in my title, it's a lie, it's really three theologians, and what I mean is, we're talking about, um, uh, C- C- uh, uh, Lewis Berry Schaefer wrote a little book, he called it, on the spiritual life that was well-received and popular in its first edition. Um, in 1918, but it didn't rise. He didn't think it rose to the level of notoriety that someone like the most famous and important theologian of, uh, of his day, B.B. Warfield, would say something about, would even know about it. Well, B.B. Warfield in 1919 in Princeton Theological Review wrote a, a journal review five pages in depth, to, and it shows how, how much and well he had read this book. You know, today review articles are, you know, three quarters of a page in a journal. This is five pages of interaction, some in-depth and inter- interesting uh, the way, and very helpful uh, re- review. It was very mean, but very helpful. And um, Chafer fired back in the second edition with a footnote on page 67, and it'll be on page 67 in this book. It's a footnote that's really two pages. Pages 67 and 68 are mostly this footnote, um, uh, and that's, that's it. Uh, page 67, this is the footnote on page 67, and then page 68... The, other, the rest of the footnote, two pages of a footnote, um, and it's in finer print and closer together, a uh, rebuttal to Warfield, and that's what I'm analyzing with you this morning. It's historical theology, but it's also become systematic theology, and here's my thesis. If we'll look at this, we'll see a very strong difference between what Warfield is, which I would say is consistent, reformed, Calvinistic sanctification, and what Chafer is teaching, and what he held to. And this is 1918, and Chafer is... Uh, early on, compared, you know, he died in 1952, but it's, uh, it doesn't change uh, much. There's some of the wording that changes. He, he, he actually listens to some criticism about some of his wording that sounds like another camp, but uh, the wording uh, may change, but the substance is, is identical in, um, mostly in, uh, in the Systematic Theology published in 1948. So, uh, but that's the two theologians, Chafer, the new guy, and Warfield, who's um, on his way out. And uh, but you really can't understand Chafer unless you've looked at Schofield, Schofield, and uh, that's a helpful thought as we'll talk about our influences. So, tale of two theologians. <clears throat> uh, yesterday, it was uh, an important remark that hey, all this modeling, all this abstraction, all this categorization, all this outlining. Um, is needful if we're going to get into this and talk about the differences because you should know we need the perspective to know um, not only that we, we, we don't have a position that's mainstream in our, in our view of sanctification, and that's okay, and everyone you encounter pretty much is going to have a different view, but it's, that doesn't make them right or you, you wrong because there's the difference. You need to know this is the difference. 
And, um, and so that's part of the value of the seminary education is perspective. We want to share that with you, but we would be wrong. We would be wrong all day if we didn't focus on the scriptures. <clears throat> Chafer's main distinctive in the doctrine of sanctification was a very simple uh, understanding of a correct interpretation of Galatians uh, 5.16. Galatians 5.16. And I don't know if you like lifesavers, but I do. So I'll put it in colors. Chafer's main distinctive in the doctrine of church age sanctification is pneumatology. Um, who has a, a copy of the eight volumes at home? I mean, let's be charismatic and raise our hands, okay? Um, <clears throat> eight volumes, which is really more like six in argumentation because volume seven is summaries. Volume eight is a sketch, biographical sketch by Frank, Fred Lincoln and, uh, and the, uh, the, the index, which is a very helpful index, but, and that was a lot of work, but that's not the substance of his argumentation, volumes one through six. Volume six is um, pneumatology. Um, in, in volumes one through six, do you know where sanctification falls? Do you know where? I mean, I was looking when I was thinking about this. Um, we don't use the Schaefer Seminary. I mean, we don't use Schaefer's theology at Dallas Seminary anymore. Tragically, tra- tragically, we use it at Schaefer Seminary. <clears throat> and when we stop doing that, we ought to take the shingle down. It's not Schaefer Seminary anymore. But, uh, um, but where is the doctrine of sanctification? I mean, we had a class on it. Sanctification and ecclesiology was a systematic theology course where we read the five views books. But where is sanctification in Schaefer? He put it in pneumatology. It's a subset. It's a subset of pneumatology because that's the central focus of Schaefer's ministry. And it is complete. And, and when you understand that, that it's about the Holy Spirit, it, hold on to it. It's about the Holy Spirit. You understand Schaefer. And you take the next step on that, that his, he wouldn't attack Keswick. He never talked about, well, he, he would actually say, I'm not Keswick. He, we'll talk about where he said that. He wouldn't uh, necessarily attack Reformed theology. But if he had a, 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 careful about saying Schaefer attacked, he was a very gentle, kind man. He'll talk about the, the virtues and extol someone he completely disagrees with right before he says, and here's where I disagree. But, um, and he, he was a real gentleman. But if he had a, 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 somebody he liked to throw a straw man up and beat up on, it was the holiness movement which is also focal, focused on the Holy Spirit. And he's intending to, and, and with Schofield's influence, they're, they're trying to distinguish themselves from what is being done in the excesses of the holiness movement on the Holy Spirit while saying this spiritual life as dispensationalists with the coming of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost means we are characterized by the Spirit. That's our central distinctive. And so Galatians 5.16, and I want to just go in some detail with you. Let me see if I, my mouse will, will do what I want. There we go. So right here, he begins with a present active indicative, I am saying, Lego, I say. I, and, and it's continuous action. We could debate on what type of, con, of present tense it is. But he's, this is my presentation. And the de means I'm changing the, the thought process from what I'm arguing. If you read Galatians 5, it is a strong break. And so it's the next step in the argument. And he's actually uh, recovering a little bit what he starts in verse 1. It's for freedom that Christ sets you free. Therefore, uh, don't be uh, enslaved again uh, in a yoke of bodies. Let me, that's my paraphrase of Galatians 5. 1 and 5.16. 5.16, now I'm saying. And he just said uh, that if you want to do circumcision, you're severing yourself from Christ. The people that are bothering it, which they would uh, mutilate themselves is the way that we euphemistically translate that. Um, and then, but now I'm saying, walk in the spirit, pneumati, this word right here is a dative singular for pneuma, pneuma. And it's in the dative, and that needs an interpretive uh, choice. We have to make one of three main choices. There's, when you see a dative, there's three possibilities. It's an indirect object, it's instrumental, or it's locative. It's the means, instrumental, the means by which we do something, or the sphere in which we do something. And the King James, the authorized version, hand over our heart, it's, it is, after all, 2011, 400 years since the, the King James was first translated, 1611. Thank you. I was, I was waiting for the amen on that. I, you know, in the conservative circles, the more I... Fundamentalism today um, is largely comprised of King James only-ism. And you're going to encounter that. And I, I submit uh, Ron Merriman's booklet, uh, a, a, an appeal for a calm in the, in the discussion. Um, and uh, be, you have to, we have to be careful about how we uh, address King James only because it becomes a very emotional, uh, deal-breaking issue that, that believers will separate over. And I don't see a basis for separation. I mean, Schofield 
edited the King James. I mean, his Bible is the King James text from Oxford. And there were other options at the time. There was the RSV at the time. I mean, Schofield uh, published the, King James, uh, the, the, the Schofield Bible in 1909. The American Standard Version is out by 1901, but he chose King James. And uh, I love the King James, but, um, but uh, come on. It's inspired in Greek and Hebrew. And uh, anyway, don't chase that rabbit too far. But anyway, by means of the Spirit, the King James says, in the Spirit. The um, Darby translation says, in the Spirit. The New King James went with the same interpretation, in the Spirit. But the New American Standard, in my opinion, very helpfully says, by the Spirit. And that's Chafer and Schofield on Galatians 5.16, that we're talking about means. And that's central to their view of the Christian life. That the means by which you do anything that pleases God is the Holy Spirit. Now, we can talk about mechanics, we can talk about dynamics, we can talk about all the other things, but that's, that's the, the point of departure, where we said last night, Abraham Kuyper, in the, talking about the Holy Spirit, hundreds of pages, no filling of the Spirit, no mention of these things, because if you're Reformed, you have a view of inev- inevitability. So chafer for chafer, it is the means by which we accomplish what pleases God is through the Holy Spirit. Walk by means of the Spirit, and uh, epithumia, okay, is in the uh, accusative, and this word here is the lust of the flesh. And I've translated it in its order, so, and it's color-coded so you can see. You can, it's kind of an interlinear translation for you. And the lust of the flesh, epithumion sarkos, the lust of the flesh, that's pretty, I think that's pretty self-evident. We're talking about the ults in nature and its tendency and temptation of you uh, to, uh, to sin. Which, by the way, we understand volitionally we're responsible when we sin because we've made a choice even though the flesh has kind of, if you will, they've, they've, the flesh has teed up the ball and you, you've hit it. You, if, you know what I mean? The flesh kind of caddies up that ball and, and sets it up and then you hit the ball. And that's about as much as I understand about golf. But <laughs> the lust of the flesh, and then this is the exciting part to me, uh, is you have an ume, ume, right here, double negative in Greek is the strongest possible negation, uh, well, except for if you have a subjunctive. And this is one, teleo in the subjunctive. And the, 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 the word means complete, to bring to completion or maturity or uh, fulfill. You won't do. You, the lust is served up, but you won't hit the ball, as it were. You don't have to because you don't have to obey the ults in nature because you are walking by the Spirit. And it's in the subjunctive that teleo is the subjunctive because uh, it's the strongest way. It's the, it's the mood of possibility, if you will. It's... it's, it's negating ume with the strongest possible negation possibility if in other words you are walking by the spirit you cannot fulfill the lust of the flesh ume plus a subjunctive now that doesn't come out at all to me in the in, in any kind of technicolor when i read it in any english translation in fact if we put that my translation in an english you know in a new translation of the bible you would still be like well i just don't quite you need someone to bring it to you I need someone to bring it to me from the original, and that's uh, one of our distinctives here at Chafer Seminary, is that you're going to illuminate people by getting them closer and closer to the text. And we look at that as a James 1, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Which Chafer, by the way, remarked on that verse, draw near to God, and he'll draw near to you, as, okay, whose who's, uh, who's, uh, turn is it? Who's supposed to take the first step there? Draw near to God, and he'll draw near to you. See, there's, there is a personal, responsible interaction. And this is a, this is a nice introduction to what, uh, what Schofield is, is doing. So the, uh, the central issue for Chafer on, on sanctification is dependence on the Holy Spirit. Dependence on, I mean, and that needs to, before we start drawing boxes and categorization, this is the exegetical conclusion that, that defines his understanding of our responsibilities. And in He That Is Spiritual, when you uh, just check out your table of contents, I, this isn't my book, I just know it well, so I'm glad there was one on the table here. Um, by the way, I noted that uh, this one was a gift. Oh, no, what? never mind, never mind. Okay, um, let's see. Conditions for the filling of the Spirit for what he considered true spirituality. The first is not to grieve the Spirit. The second is not to quench the Spirit. And the third is to walk by the Spirit. So he uses uh, grieve not, Ephesians 4.30, as his jumping off point for the first condition. Don't sin, if is, is how we're interpreting that. Quench not the Spirit. Don't stop him. Because one seems to be lupeo. It's, it means to sorrow. However, God is sorrowing over sin. That's the idea. The other is to stop an in, a process that's in process. Like, like you've got a, a glowing hot metal and, and you stick it in the quenching bath. And um, 
quench not the Spirit, two negative re- requirements, and then he says walk by the Spirit. Chafer starts with the text, and then he develops his categories, and, um, and well, okay, that's... That would be regarded by the systematizers like Warfield as, as um, not scholarly or um, just not acceptable because it doesn't go with what the Westminster Divine said. And that, to me, is the big difference between Schaefer and his contemporaries. Just I want you to hear Schaefer on this. Thus, the walk in the Spirit is not only a constant series of commitments. Now, we, we've got this question. Does Schaefer believe in a, um, a one-shot commitment, dedication? Well, sometimes you read them, you think yes, and sometimes you read them and think no. It's any time you need to commit your way to the Lord, you do it. And this is one of those places where it, I think it, it shows that he is at least unclear, if not uh, generally rejecting the higher life, uh, one-shot dedication model. The walk in the Spirit is not only a constant series of commitments, but a constant casting of oneself on the Spirit with the confidence and anticipation that all needed support will be realized. That's his view of the attitude, okay? We haven't talked about the mechanic that if you're not being filled by the Spirit, that how you get it back. And he would agree with you if you, if you think it's 1 John 1, 9. And he got that from Schofield, that, that if we're out of fellowship, that we have to confess it. And we're, I mean, I'm sorry, he didn't get it from Schofield. He got it from John in 1 John 1, right? By the way, is rebound, as some might call it, 1 John 1, 9, or is 1 John 1, 9 rebound? I think, I think Schaefer would say, no, no, no. We're, we're, we're in the text first, and then we get the category. 1 John 1, 9 okay, is the basis on which we might make the illustration of the category. And I don't, I don't think, that, uh, I don't think that, that... I don't think some people have fully understood what's been said. You know, I'm, this is a study on grandpa for me. Uh, I love doing genealogy in theological matters. I couldn't care less about uh, genealogy. Um, you know, like where, go back in the, far enough. There's a place called Roseland somewhere, but so what? Uh, <laughs> but where where did we get these ideas, and why is my life the life it is? As I've walked by the Spirit, as my pastor Robert B. Theme Jr. taught me, because he was taught by a man named Chafer in the same way that. Uh, that I was taught by him. And Chafer didn't just get this uh, from, from reading his Bible. He was a Bible reader, yeah, but he had a teacher, and his name was C.I. Schofield. And he said after a year, a life of, of, of Bible study as a young man in his 30s, uh, I heard a, one hour from, from Schofield, and it was a crisis. He doesn't mean a second blessing, although some of you, have, maybe you're having it right now. I don't blame you. But, um, but the, <laughs> he was having a crisis over that he learned more in one hour from this teaching from Schofield that he learned it all his life. Because when you've been taught and you say, I didn't know it, but that's exactly right because that's the scripture. When God uses spiritual gifts to edify the body, you know it and it's, it's, a, it's, it's a wonderful illumination. It's a wonderful blessing. That's what Chafer Seminary is committed to is developing pastor teachers who actually teach the word of God. And hold our, uh, we hold our finger in the text and, and hold our place and it's only from the text. So no, um, Rebound is 1 John 1, 9. That's the answer. We get it from the text. It's the Bible. It's not because somebody said it, but somebody did teach us. John said it, in other words. <clears throat> 260, page 263. No intelligent step can be taken, Schaefer says, until there is some distinction born in mind about the difference in method and practice. Schaefer is very dense to read. He's a lot of stuff, a lot of prepositional phrases in there, but he says... The difference in method and practice between walking by dependence upon self or the flesh and walking by dependence upon the spirit. See, he's making that, that Galatians 5.16 distinction between it's either the flesh or the spirit. And he would say that correlates nicely with John, 1 John chapter 1, that in God is light and no darkness at all. No, I like to say to my, my people back in Preston, there's no dimmer switch on fellowship. You're either in fellowship or you're not. Because God is light, no darkness. And that's the context for the discussion where we say, okay, and we get to what we're after is 1 John 1, 9. What do I do about the sin? What do I do about it? And by the way, the Apostle John tells us in 1 John 2, 2, you know this well, that I tell you these things, little children, right after saying if we confess our sins, he forgives them and cleanses us. Uh, the Apostle John says, I tell you these things, little children, so that you sin not. It's not just restorative, it's preventative. And according to John, Walking in the light or the truth, that's another big deal in the context. Don't lie. Don't make God a liar. Tell the truth. Confess our sins. This is where God is, and this is the preventative for sin. <clears throat> in other words, um, 
There's no pre-bounding, but anyway. Um, all right. The walk by the Spirit must be the outworking, Schaefer continued, the outworking of personal experience, not the attempted imitation of others. Now, this is, uh, this is a great thing you see in dispensational circles that have followed after Chafer. You see men that are studying the text and coming in the Spirit to the conclusions that they're certain of. And, you see, and, they, and they become helpful in teaching the Word, just like Schofield, just like Chafer. They may not agree 100% with Schofield and Chafer, but they're working with God in the text, like Paul is talking about, men who pull, who have their Bible and they read it all their lives and study the Word. This idea of um, personal experience as opposed to imitation. I want to contend that Warfield is just the goalie guarding the, 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 the Westminster Confession. All right? There's, and, and I'm not proposing innovation. I'm saying you have to have, uh, you have to come to your own conclusions. It's so valuable to do that. And, um, uh, y- Pentecost is known for having some, what he calls his heresies, his own ideas that nobody else has ever said. That you, learn, you read the Bible with him and he says, look at it right there. And you're like, well, there it is. Zane Hodges, a man, uh, he said one thing to me over lunch one time. I got to have lunch with him before he went home. Um, Zane Hodges, uh, and discussing, it came out what, what my background was. There's a name that thou shalt not pronounce around Dallas Theological Seminary, which is my pastor. I mean, you don't say the name. It's like... Um, it's like in Harry Potter, the most powerful wizard from the school. You never mention his name because he's the bad guy. That's the way they kind of construe. And I don't get mad about Dallas Seminary. I'm just saying that's the way you kind of feel when you're there as a Bob Theme kid. Um, um, and that's okay. I've, li- I've listened to Chafer. It's, they can differ. We love them anyway. And, um, but um, uh, this, uh, this, this rugged, this is my exegetical conclusion, this is what I'm going with because before the Lord, I'm convinced that this is what the text is saying. And, I, and I've got my six arguments for it and so forth. That's, that's Zane Hodges. Very helpful interpreter. I don't agree with everything he said. But a very helpful interpreter um, of the scriptures, very helpful teacher of the scriptures. Uh, the last thing he said to me as we're leaving is, think for yourself. You know, because he heard the word theme and thought, I don't think for myself. Everybody, anybody ever felt that way? Anyway, um, that's what, that's what will be said um, by some, in some quarters, but it's okay. We love them. Not the attempted imitation of others, but the result of one's own trial of faith. It's probable that as a general method of a definite commitment in the morning of all that awaits one during the day is effective, though uh, often extra and special commitments will be required as the day advances. So he's talking about how to live day by day. Start off in the morning with a commitment. What's wrong with that, by the way, saying today is God's and not mine and I'm his and not my own and I'll serve him with my day. What's wrong with that? Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean on your, on your own understandings and all your ways. Not acknowledge, no, know him and he'll direct your paths or straighten or smooth your paths. I mean, this is, this is Chafer saying every day is a walk by the spirit. So let's start the day right. I love it. I think it's, I think it's good advice. Um, I don't think it's a legalistic call to, uh, to a, 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 you know, a, before the sun comes up, quiet time, that then when the sun goes down, you have to make the, uh, the, the assessment, but that's what he proposes. That not, not legalistically, but just in terms of practicality. The important feature of, is the character of this commitment. It's not merely asking for help during the day, a practice far too common among spiritual believers, meaning we do ask for help. He's talking about spiritual. He means the category spiritual believers are asking for help. Sure, but that's not what he means when you start off your day. Um, it's entering into a definite covenant understanding with God in which natural ability and resources are renounced and confidence exercised toward the spirit that he will himself actuate and motivate the entire life. That's what Chafer means by walking by the spirit. He's saying there is a, a, a conscious, willing commitment, and he gets it from uh, Romans 6.13 or Revelation 12, I mean Romans 12.1. There's a gaping hole in Paul's theology if he doesn't talk about how we're supposed to walk by the Spirit. If, see, where, where's the confession? I've, I've been challenged. Where's 1 John 1, 9 and, and Paul's writings in Romans and the systematic theology of the church age? Well, you don't find it in there because you find the attitude, not the mechanic. John gives you mechanics. Okay, But does anybody really believe that if you confess your sins while retaining arrogance or a failed, failure to submit to God as God? Does anybody think that retaining arrogance in willing independence or rejection of God's authority, that you're somehow forgiven and cleansed for the arrogance that you retain. My illustration of that is like uh, holding a, well, we're in Texas, holding a, some manure 
uh, cow patty and uh, while you wash your hands. <laughs> and you walk away and nobody wants to shake your hands. You, you, the cleansing is, is offered for confession, absolutely. But if you retain arrogance, which is the other side of the coin of not yielding to the Spirit, in my opinion, then you see the problem? There's an attitude that goes along with the mechanic. And, and there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of mechanic machination, ma- you know, like mechanical, which fails to observe the personal relationship we have with God. The miracle of your existence and my existence and, our, and, and how God made us is that we are persons. Your dog isn't a person. Your pet chameleon isn't a person. The, the cows that we're going to have for lunch are not persons. You're a person, and God is a tripersonal being. And that, that means instantly that a lot of things that the Bible explicates that are just, that are just impl- implicit derivative ideas about our relationship, our responsibilities to him, personal. <clears throat> Lewis Berry Chafer, his dates, 1871 to 1952, when he went home to be with the Lord. He's the young man in the discussion. Now, I want you to notice um, that this is uh, 10 years after the commencement of the Civil War that he's born. When he talks in the, in, the, in the MP3s, the Chafer Lectures, you can get, by the way, the Sam Littlepage um, uh, CD uh, has, I believe, 16 uh, lessons on the spiritual life. Uh, the one that, uh, that Robbie has put out on the, 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 the Internet there on his, his site, on his me disc thing, um, is um, a, a number more. And I did the correlation because that's what I was studying. I, I know uh, Grandpa better than I've ever known him before now after doing all this work. Um, Number one on uh, the little page notes is number seven on Robbie's disc, which means that there are, if it's sequential, there are six previous to the first one on the little page disc. And if you listen to him in that sequence, it, it does make sense. But anyway, um, I commend you to listen to Chafer. It's, it's incredible to hear uh, how he teaches and how familiar it is. Um, and um, what a gentleman, what a kind, not weak, but what a kind and gentle uh, man who would... Uh, in his stories, tells the students in the 40s at Dallas Seminary, toward the end of his ministry, he's telling them the stories of, of how he came along, how I founded the school, or how God used me to found, found the school, how the Schofield Reference Bible came about, how important it is to my study. You know, um, anyway, uh, Lewis Berry Chafer, I, uh, I have I've been part of the bandwagon where we've revered him because uh, he was the pastor for my pastor, and so I, by, by um, you know, by that relationship, I appreciate it. But having read him more deeply and listened to him, especially listened to him, I have a real profound uh, respect and appreciation for Lewis Berry Chafer. Um, and uh, what, what I find most distinct about him is, you notice we're not a denomination. We have, uh, we have our pastors that belong to denominations, but they hold the same doctrinal statement we hold at Chafer Seminary. How does that work? What is this non-denominationalism? Uh, it's it's a Chaferian uh, conviction that the body of Christ is a unity, and this is, as a dispensationalist, the unity we have is a picture of that the Father sent the Son, John 17, and 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 he's interested in that more than denominational d- distinctions, yet he's holding to doctrine and saying, let's just get to the Bible. And so, uh, you know, the, 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 the Presbyterian church, uh, you know, kicked him out. He didn't leave them. And uh, he, has, he has all these associates and affiliates, and everybody knows him, and he knows everybody. He's got a kind word and a loving thing to say about all these Keswick teachers, about all these Reformed teachers, about all these different people, all millennialists, you know, post-millennialists. He'll talk about all of them, but he loves them, but he just differs with them on their position. He's very kind, very Christian in his uh, love. And I think it's, I have no question in my mind, it's a genuine love that just says, I, I love so-and-so, but they're wrong. And he doesn't really say it that way. I mean, that, we like that tough way, you know, wrong. But, but he's, he's gentle about, you know, um, about Warfield. There was no greater theologian. He goes for five minutes about there's no greater theologian in his day than B.B. Warfield. If you read what Warfield wrote, well, not in this one, but in the Princeton Review, if you read what Warfield said about him, the way he said it, he's mean. He's just, he's just rough on him. And Schaefer, uh, just very laudatory. And then, but then he says, but the problem with, the, with his view is that these are the following scriptures. Lewis Berry Chafer, gentle, kind, and um, there's a thing here that God has given us um, called loyalty. I don't know if you've, uh, if you've grown up under a pastor that, uh, that you are grateful to God for, but there's a scripture in First Thess that says we're supposed to honor those who work hard at preaching and teaching. 
it was great to see Dr. Pentecost's response to my um, unguarded remark that Dr. Chafer's systematic theology is difficult to read. I said it in class. You know, that uh, nanogenarian has no trouble hearing. Okay. <laughs> I, sitting there in the room, am probably the most Chaferian person besides Pentecost. And um, it was on, and it was just before class, so we were kind of chatting around. And I said, "But he's hard to read." And what I mean is, there is a certain, there's a Chaferian way of writing that is dense, and you have to really, you know, start early in the morning after, you know, and, and maybe like Jesus served Peter some fish breakfast, so he'd be sharp. You know, I don't know, but you, you got to. He's he's a challenge to read. I said that, and Chafer took. I mean, uh, Pentecost took it as a as a criticism or as a you know as an insult or something. Because he's so used to the, the, the being mean about Chafer at Dallas Seminary, I think. Now I'm in psychology, but and, and he looked at me, he shot me a look. He didn't say anything, but <laughs> and I wanted to say, but but what I mean is the, the best theology we can find is, is just is dense, and I'm not smart enough. That's what I'm trying to say. And anyway, um, he recovered. We had class. It was great. But BB <laughs> Warfield. Born 1851, 10 years before the Civil War commenced. What you just did your quick math, they're 20 years apart. 20 years apart. 1918, on Schaefer, he's 47 years old when he publishes He That Is Spiritual the first time. 47 years old, he's been a disciple of uh, Schofield for not quite 20 years. Um, 1919, uh, Benjamin Warfield, he's got three years left. He's, uh, when he died at 69. He's at the peak of his power, of his influence, and he doesn't have to be nice, I guess. He's just going to be rough. But I uh, don't want to beat up on him too much. He's very helpful. One of the greatest gifts God's given to us as dispensationalists is B.B. Warfield's critique of he that is spiritual because it really clarifies so much for us. He's a smart man. C.I. Schofield, uh, born 1843. See, he's the old man in the story. He's the, uh, he's the, the, old, the older uh, gentleman. Uh, 43 to 21, died the same year as Warfield. And um, Schofield's an interesting character. He's a dispatch writer in the Civil War. He's a highly decorated Civil War soldier. And so he was a, 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 an enlisted man, private, you know, with a, with a horse, which that's not normal, right? And he also has access to the officers. He's around them. He talks to them. He's, he's not, uh, and by the way, the Civil War broke out, and he volunteered right as it was time for him to go to college. I commend to you uh, the, the open source document, uh, the um, the. I forget how the title. It's the biography of C.I. Schofield by Charles G. Trumbull. Read it. It's like reading an autobiography. I think it's um, largely dictated. It sounds. I mean, it psychologically evaluates what he was thinking and how he was feeling and you know his attitudes and stuff. It talks about how he wrote the, the the notes for the Schofield Reference Bible and his experiences. And um, people say nobody knows really knows what Sch- Schofield's like. Well, you read his autobiography. Well, his biography by Charles Trumbull. It's um, it's uh, great to, to get to know great grandpa, <laughs> but you can get that as a PDF. Um, just Google. Be careful with your Googling, but uh, you can find Schofield out there. 1843 to 1921. Uh, he was only he was less than 20 miles from Appomattox Courthouse in the uh, in, at the uh, surrender of Lee to, to uh, Grant. Hey, but those of you who are um, down on the Confederacy, don't worry. He was also a, an official in the Grant administration. He was a, a designated uh, a prosecutor, uh, a federal prosecutor, um, as part of Grant's administration in Kansas. And um, <clears throat> we're not going to talk much more about Schofield, uh, except to talk about his theology in a moment. But just, just to kind of get the sense of the timeline of the history, uh, you know, history is just one uh, thing after another, Right. <laughs> Um, but not really. There's a, there, it's important how this all worked. And you, we need to get a sense of this. I mean, we think of the Civil War. They're riding horses and shooting cannons. And, uh, and, and uh, they're, they're still loading muskets. Um, but it wasn't that long ago. 1871 to 1952, that's Chafer. Warfield, these are his dates. So there's an overlap. But look how much longer Chafer has to minister after Warfield's done. In a way, Chafer really looked at Dallas Theological Seminary as the heir of Princeton Theological Seminary. We sang last night, um, All Hail the Power, in the diadem version. That's the Princeton Theological Seminary fight song. You thought I was going to say the Dallas Theological Seminary fight song. Well, it is, because they stole it. 
They said, we like that so much, and we're, we're about inerrancy and the, the fundamentals of the faith, too, that we're going to uh, use that, too. We're going to be the new Princeton, in a way. I think that's part of the attitude. We want to be the best possible scholarship, except we want to be biblical rather than uh, dedu- primarily deductive. We want to be inductive, and that's the difference. But um, uh, very important, the connection between Princeton and, and uh, Dallas Seminary and, and the way Chafer's modeling, pardon the expression, modeling things. All right, so Schofield... Schofield is uh, really a generation uh, before Chafer and, and uh, contemporary with Warfield. You would think Warfield would, would face off against Schofield, right? That seems like that would be the, the, the conflict. In the Keswick thing, R.A. Torrey, Keswick, C.I. Schofield, they're at odds. They differ on the, the, the mechanics of the filling of the Spirit. And, uh, and we're not praying for the Spirit. We're, well, actually, we're not getting a second blessing. That's what he argued with. Um, in Chafer's generation, it's not Torrey. It's not R.A. Torrey. It's um, F.B. Meyer wonderful uh, uh, Keswick theologian uh, and, and Schaefer, they're at odds. They're in their own generation. But this is, this is Grandpa Warfield throwing a thunderbolt you know, from on high at little you know, n- new guy Schaefer is kind of the, the picture. And uh, I like how David responds in his uh, fight with Goliath in the, in the footnote. It's a very uh, helpful response. Warfield's review, the thesis, what does he say? He that is spiritual teaches a corruption of the pure reform Westminster view of sanctification with Wesleyan Arminianism. That is the crux. That's the thesis that, that uh, Warfield proposes. That you've taken good old-fashioned Calvinism. This, kid, this guy is a, a son of a, of a Presbyterian Calvinist preacher. He's been raised by the right people, but he's fallen in with bad company, and now he's corrupting what is obviously inevitable, your sanctification, with this idea that we have responsibilities. There's Warfield's thesis. The explanation he proposes, how he got there, was uh, he's a product of higher life, victorious life teachers. This is code language. Higher life, victorious life means Keswick. It means Keswick. Real quick thumbnail sketch of Keswick history. Uh, the, the book is Stephen Barabbas. He's a Keswick writer who in 1952 published The History of the Keswick Convention. It was a book called So Great Salvation. It's a quick read. It's very helpful from an insider with we who are outsiders, believe me, to see what, it, what Keswick really means. And uh, one thing that you get is uh, these Americans went over there and started it. It's an American phenomenon that I believe is a product and part of the Bible conference movement. At least it's, it's contemporary, and I need to do more research on that. But uh, um, anyway... Uh, you don't have to know everything about it to do it, right? We're having a Bible conference here. Uh, but, uh, but, but the Americans have written these higher life books, The Higher Christian Life by W.E. Boardman. And um, the, uh, Robert Pearsall Smith was the first to write one, and then his wife later wrote uh, The Christian Secret of a, higher, of a Happy Life. And it's, uh, it's this presentation of the higher life. And um, they were popular books in America, more popular in England. They're going over to England to have conferences. And the thing is, Christians are wanting to know how do we live this thing. We believe in the Reformation truth of faith alone in Christ alone. We believe the Bible is the answer, but we need to be taught. And that's why, by the way, Chafer Sem- uh, Dallas Seminary was founded. Well, Chafer too. That's why Chafer founded Dallas, <laughs> because we need to be taught. And, and they're not, we're not being taught. So you've got this, this grassroots thing. We'll go hear something, and it's across denominations. So people from different denominational affiliations will come and hear these conferences in America. See, Barabbas is very helpful. He says, our Keswick conferences are not events where you go sit and listen for, your, uh, for learning academically. That, he's very clear on that. The Keswick Convention is a spiritual clinic that is specifically designed by the, the, the organizers over five days to bring you on day three to absolute crisis, surrender, so that we are now able to receive the second blessing from the Holy Spirit. You, and Barabbas says you cannot separate the Keswick methodology of the convention from the Keswick theology. In fact, you don't really understand it. I'll take his word on it because I'm not real clear on how all this works. But uh, you, you can't take the... the the theology, as, as it well understood, until you've experienced it. It is um, not the Bible conference. You're the people he's talking about when he says, We're the, we, we sit and listen at these Bible conferences and be taught. Now, they do have teachers. They did have to, Chafer taught at Keswick. But if you read him and listen to him as he's you know, looking back over his life, he's saying, but they, they don't agree. I'll show you some of those quotes here in a moment. So Chafer's a product of these teachers. And um, the idea, this is the phrase that really just 
tears you to the, to the core. I'm the kind of Calvinist that believes in eternal security. That's, my, that's where my Calvinism is, is kind of hung on. Eternal security is, is, if you believe in eternal security, you're a Calvinist. Amen. Jean Calvin, I'm there. I'm a, I'm a, I have it. Um, so do you. Um, but um, I, I guess uh, I'm also the, the kind of theologian that believes man has responsibilities, and so is Chafer, and we'll look at that. But uh, Warfield says that if God is only gi- giving you the Spirit to make it possible for you to walk, to obey, if it's only supplying possibilities that, that aren't necessarily going to happen, if it's possible, in other words, for a believer to fail in the Christian life and, to, and not to walk by the Spirit, then that's the quintessence of Arminianism. That's the quintessence. It means the idea that, ma- that God provides possibilities, unlimited atonement, but not actualities, not inevitable results, uh, the redemption. You see, and, and Chafer held to unlimited atonement, and he dif- distinguished it from redemption. <clears throat> I'm telling you, this is helpful, because what we're saying is that Chafer broke the... Cat- what, what Warfield says is Chafer broke the, our categories, and he's, he's combining things that ought not be combined. And apparently, and Chafer's response is going to be a helpful thing, Mr. Chafer, he says, is in the unfortunate and one would think very uncomfortable condition of having two inconsistent systems of religion struggling together in his mind. This is his opening shot. This is how he starts off the, the, the review. And that's the nicest thing I think he says in the whole review about him. When I say he's mean, I mean there's a place in here where he calls Chafer an uh, exegetical virtuoso. You know what a virtuoso is, right? It's the, it's the keyboardist. It's the piano player who can play the thing Beethoven wrote. It's not Beethoven. It's just the keyboardist. You know, just the performer. But performers spend so much time refining their craft and getting good that they, they can show you what they can do. They can show off. That's what a virtuoso is known for. Is okay, we're waiting for the cadenza, we call it, uh, where you, you just have measures of, of you just fill it in here. And the virtuoso takes off and just he shows what he can do. That's what uh, part, part where the flight of the bumblebee came from was you had a famous uh, instrumentalist who needed something that, uh, that kind of challenged him. So you get this, this crazy thing that, uh, that was to, to be, um, you know, the, the virtuoso needed something like that. Well, that's what uh, Warfield's calling Chafer. He's an exegetical virtuoso, and he, he points out how he uses Romans 5.5, 5, that, uh, that somehow the pouring forth of the love of God in our hearts through the Spirit is, um, is to, to be the love of God shed forth through us, that that amounts to exegetical virtuosity, that he's showing off instead of just saying that God has shown us his love. And on that topic, I happen to hear one of the messages, not dealing with Warfield, but uh, Chaffer says to the young men at Dallas Seminary in the 40s, the, the kind of theologian you are is going to hang or fall on how you interpret Romans 5 how you look at your Christian life, at your spiritual life. Interesting. But, um, but so Warfield's kind of tough on him. And if you, by the way, if you attack his exegesis, you've destroyed it. If you can destroy his exegesis, you destroy the whole thing because Schaefer's hanging everything on his exegesis. He that is spiritual is a development of, Rome, of his view of 1 Corinthians 2, uh, 5 through 3, 3. And that's, that's his starting point, seven pages on how uh, there's a difference between he who is spiritual and you who are carnal, you Corinthians. And, um, and so... I, I was going to read the 12 uh, charges to you that, that, Scope, that Warfield made, but you can read those in the paper. I want to just challenge you, uh, and if you read the article, you can isolate kind of 12 lines of attack that, that uh, Warfield makes against Chafer to support this thesis that Chafer's Arminian, that he's combining Arminianism. So I'm going to uh, bless you all with uh, skipping that. I once, uh, one of Chafer's lectures, or he, he says, um, he starts the guys off, he says, you who are in easy chairs, apparently they had a sort of informal classroom structure for this. Uh, spiritual life course that he was famous for teaching based on, it wasn't he that was spiritual, it was volume six of his systematic theology. Um, uh, he, said, uh, he said, okay, men, those of you in easy chairs, this one's for you. He says, now I lay me down to sleep. The lecture's long, the subject's deep. If he should stop before I wake, will someone kick me for pity's sake. <laughs> Schaefer's response 
in his footnote, he says, the Christian will always be filled. Oh, no, no, no. This is the, the part he footnotes. You should know this on page 67. He puts a footnote right after this statement, which he didn't take out. This is what Warfield quoted and says, this is horrible. This is Arminianism. This is unacceptable, unthinkable that man is letting God do something. But Chafer's quote that, that excited the anger, the, the animus of, uh, of Warfield, this Christian will always be filled by the Spirit while he is making the work of the Spirit possible in his life. Ooh. I'm standing by it. Schaefer stood by it. I think he's absolutely right. I think God personally and sovereignly has so organized your spiritual life that you are responsible to obey him. It's just an, it's a, it's a simple, I mean, exegesis does get involved, but that's it, a simple conclusion after all the involved exegesis. We are responsible. Imperatives do have, uh, have, uh, you know, possible responses. You know, whenever you're issued an imperative or a command, you really have two choices regarding that command. You have to. Cho- I don't have a choice. No, you have a choice. You now have a choice. Well, I will either get yes or no it. I will say yes to that command or no. And that's, ask the guys at Nuremberg. They had a choice. They could have said no. But they said, it's an order. They said yes. And um, I think that that, that is, uh, see, you can't, because of your theological ideas, you can't then say every time you get an imperative, it means it's, it's an indicative certainty that God commands I, that I do it, but because I'm filled, because I have the Holy Spirit, there's no question that I will do it. This uh, autopilot Christianity, it's, it's, um, it's just determinism. And uh, that's not how God personally interacts with us. Now, I would propose, let me get a little more metaphysical with you. I think that we as human beings cannot think of what it would be like. We don't really have the horsepower mentally to, to imagine what it would be like to create a person. This is the fantasy of our day. The fantasy writers are all about man creating persons. Uh, Isaac Asimov, I robot, the robot becomes self aware, the Terminator stuff. All the fantasy guys are they're all hung up on man doing what uh, you know what, what Mary Shelley tried to do with Frankenstein. Man is going to create a person. And I don't think we ever will. I, this artificial intelligence, the the thing becomes self aware. I am theologically committed to the absolute impossibility of this ever happening. Absolutely. Because I th- I'm so hung up on God being God and man not being God. I've been taught uh, at a Clough Theological Seminary <laughs> of uh, the, the creature-creator distinction. That's where I first learned that. And he didn't make it up. He just introduced me to it. You know? And by the way, none of these pastors we're talking about invented uh, 1 John 1, nine either. The Apostle John first said it in the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So this is the, the thing that Chafer said that made Warfield uh, write his five-page five review, I guess. This is Chafer's response. To state that spirituality is made possible on the human side, where we live and where we're responsible, if you will, by well-defined human acts and attitudes may seem, as Warfield said, a quite terrible expression. As viewed by an arbitrary theological theory, however, it is evidently biblical. Now, this is your insight into why we're not reformed. This is where we're not reformed. This is the big thing. And we are from reform. We are from the Reformation. We are a product of the solos of the Reformation. Make no mistake. But you don't stop at, at Calvin's uh, rationalizations. And you don't stop at the Westminster Divine's rationalizations either. You, you evaluate those in the light of the text. And where they're right, the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Right on. That's it. When they then contradicted by saying, uh, as the covenant tell us say, uh, redemption is the point of, of, of history, which then is no longer about the chief end of man to glorify God. Well, now we got to, well, we find a contradiction in Westminster, and we also find a contradiction of the text. <clears throat> Chafer goes over uh, further to say, though the, though the will... In his, uh, is his version of Calvinism, if you will, though the will be moved upon by the enabling power of God, spirituality, according to God's word, is made to depend upon that divinely enabled human choice. And as far as you're concerned, you have to choose. That's kind of how he would do it. Sounds kind of like an antinomy there. That God is moving on the will, but man is responsible for his choice. And he gives the, our key passages... 
for our model, our understanding of sanctification in this, uh, in this example. And I put the Greek words for the verbs that we're responsible for. Uh, Romans 12, 1, parastami, 1 and 2, present your, uh, yourselves a, a living sacrifice. Present your bodies a living sacrifice. Parastami, show up for duty. Present yourself to the boss. I am here, and in this case, for the sacrifice. Um, Galatians 5.16, peri pateo, walk by the Spirit. Peri pateo, to walk by means of the Spirit. Ephesians 4.30 is the negative. Do not lupeo, grieve not the Spirit. Lupeo, to make someone sorry, sad. That's what the word means. I'm a, I'm a, a big fan of uh, the, the doctrine of accommodation. And uh, I don't think you hurt God. I, I believe in impassibility. But the point is that there's a personal relationship that you're, that you're causing uh, damage to. It's personal. Grieve not the spirit. Then for, first Thess 5.19, spinumi is uh, quench not. That's the word for quench. Do not do that one either. And see, I think this is really neat. I think quench is a, it's, it's, it's a more mechanical description. Grieve is a personal emotive kind of idea in what he's teaching there. Quench is a mechanical thing. You're stopping something that ought to go. You're, putting, you're, 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 you're choking off the oxygen or the air, if you will, from this process. By the way, the word for air would be pneuma in, Hebrew, in Greek. In 1 John 1, 9, homo legeo. These are the verses that he lists, and I put the Greek words in there to, to confess. It doesn't say you will confess your sins and be cleansed. It says if we confess our sins. It's conditional. I learned in Greek uh, class with uh, Buse Fanning at Dallas Seminary, you can't even make first-class conditionals statements that mean since. You can't turn an if-then clause into a, uh, a deterministic clause. I learned that in, in Greek class. Now, I don't know if they like the way I'm applying that thought, but hey, a conditional if, even first-class conditional, does not then translate since. He didn't mean to say since. He could have said since. He could have done the inferential thing, but he doesn't. He does a conditional. Um, and these are sufficient evidence... Chafer says to, to, the, his, to this view that we have responsibilities to choose. And so he's teaching people in his writings to choose the things that the scriptures say to choose. He's just teaching the Bible. And uh, well, that doesn't, that's, that's the quintessence of Arminianism. I, I would like to uh, share with you the way I would kind of summarize uh, Warfield's idea. Warfield's idea, I would call, and you would probably like this, inevitable progressive perseverance. I like to coin terms, don't you? In, inevitable, progressive perseverance. It's the P in tulip. You're going to make it. Don't worry. And, and, and we read it last night. Every step of the process, the, the true believer will go through. Inevitable, progressive perseverance. Chafer's corrective. Chafer's uh, 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 corrective. <clears throat> now, you're not going to like this one so much. I wouldn't repeat it. Don't write it down. But responsible pneumatic perambulation. <laughs> Where did I get it? Pneumatic would be the spirit and perambulation would be walking. Walking by the spirit. Responsible per, pneumatic perambulation. Uh, and that's just uh, kind of a fun way, way to play with these things. But this is the difference, the ultimate difference between Warfield and Schaefer. Now, that's also the difference between Warfield and, and Keswick, between Reformed and Keswick, and we haven't yet got how we're not Keswick. I'd like to just say that for a moment. Uh, to, to describe for you how, indeed, we are not uh, coming from a Keswick perspective. In, in Warfield's critique, you do get a good, uh, a good profile for many of Chafer's distinctive two natures in the believer, the possibility of failure, carnal Christians versus spiritual Christians, all the things that are kind of distinctive of Chafer, Warfield highlights them in his 12 charges. And that's, a, that's why I say this is a great gift. You couldn't have a better mind to evaluate your theological position, even though he's attacking it, than, than Warfield. It's so very helpful the way he sort of uh, standardized things. And I think, uh, I think Schaefer used that. Schaefer said, and I, I'm not a transcriptionist, but I had to like pause and rewind the MP3 and pause and rewind to, like, to write this out. But here you have it. Now, I've had a controversy for years with the Keswick movement in this country. Schaefer said somewhere between the year 1946 and 1952. Okay, at the end of his ministry, I've had a controversy with the Keswick movement in this country. Charlie Trumbull wrote the biography of Schofield. Considered himself a Timothy if Schofield was Paul. Charlie Trumbull, editor of the Sunday School Times, the leader of a Keswick in America. He was the editor of the Sunday School Times, was the head of that movement, American Keswick. He was one of my closest bosom friends. Now that is an insight in a chafer's heart. He's one of my closest bosom friends, and I can't get along with his theology. You see it? 
There's no, there in Schaefer's mind, there's none of this cut you off because we differ. That wasn't his approach. His approach was our unity in Christ is more important than the differences we might have on interpretations of lesser matters. And he, this is a big deal for him, the matter he's going to describe. Very interesting. Uh, that's why, again, we're non-denominational. We didn't start a Bible church denomination. We all seem to have the same doctrinal statement. But we will all say, no dividing the body of Christ. We're not babies like in 1 Corinthians 3. As he, and he knew very well that I did not hold what was taught in the Keswick movement. That's a pretty strong disclaimer, isn't it? He knew that. And yet the Keswick movement adopted my little book on the spiritual life as the authentic and identified and recognized statement of the spiritual life. Now, see, this is a great principle we got in Keswick versus Chafer. Keswick jumps on. Read McWilkin in the Five Views book. Five Views. They say, well, yeah, I like everything Walford said. I like it. I like. They just jump on and say, that's what we believe. Until you start, we start saying, but you're saying things we don't say, and we have to make these things distinct. So Chafer says he held to the thing. Uh, they accepted uh, that, that, that I, my, he that is spiritual is the definitive, definitive statement of spiritual life when I taught the very thing they didn't hold. <laughs> what was? Now listen to it. What did I teach? I told you it's Galatians 5.16 is, is the central issue for Chafer. What did I teach? Well, I taught that deliverance... Notice he's speaking. I'm just transcribing speech here. Well, well I taught that deliverance comes from the third person of the Godhead and not from the second person. That is enough for him to say, I'm not Keswick, because they're confused on mechanics. We said last night that the, uh, the models congeal at about 85%. We all agree on 85% of the stuff. It's 15% of the differences. See, Warfield is, is coloring this thing with fat crayons to say that, that Keswick is the same as, as Chafer, what he's saying. No, there's, there's probably a lot more agreement with Keswick and Chafer than, with, uh, than, with, than, than Warfield, but... The differences are sufficient for us to say that Chafer is his own model, and that's kind of my uh, conclusion I get out of this, this uh, research. Now he says, um, it comes from the third person of the Godhead, not from the second, and they just thoughtlessly, continually said that it was Jesus that delivered me. It isn't. Now I know that I can do all things through Christ strengthening me. Yes, I know that. And I know he said, apart from me, ye can do nothing. That's in John 15. But when it comes to the great doctrine of deliverance from evil, it's always by the power of the indwelling spirit. See, he's making a Trinitarian distinction. A Trinitarian distinction. <clears throat> One, one last thought, but on what ground can he do it? On the ground of something that Christ has done. I have, uh, I think, a 20 seconds left. Chafer and Schofield, where are these guys different? I, I, my, my paper is called Not Warfield or uh, Schofield. Well, why? Well, on how to be filled with the Spirit, there's a vast distinction. Uh, quench not the Spirit, grieve not the Spirit, walk by the Spirit. That's Chafer on how to be filled by the Spirit. You said, well, where's First John 1, 9 if you're not? filled by the Spirit. If you're out of fellowship, then 1 John 1, 9 is recovery. But he's talking about positive mechanics and uh, what do you do about quenching and grieving? You confess your sins. Schofield, he says, yes, negatively, quench not, grieve not, but positively, you have to yield. You have to yield. And then you have to have faith in Christ to bestow the Spirit. And he does his famous Schofieldian correlation, but he gets it wrong here with John 7, 37, 39, the, the giving of the Spirit. No. Wrong, dispensationally un unsound. Give him five more years and a couple of conversations with Chafer, he probably would have sorted this out. But this is 1899, his book, Plain Papers on the Spirit. Prayer to Christ for the filling of the Spirit. <clears throat> That's Keswick. That's Keswick. Pray to receive the Spirit. That, by the way, is where Chafer, talking about F.B. Meyer, says, I can't even teach the same thing this man teaches. Well, this, is, uh, this has been a wonderful uh, morning with you on uh, the history of our... Um, of our seminary and our uh, doctrine. How did we get where we are? Well, first of all, Chafer's theological method, he believes inductive exegesis used to evaluate the rational systematic theological categories will modify those categories. And he's willing to do that, and it's on the Bible, and I'll hang my hat on 1 John 1, 9, Galatians 5, 16, 5, 16 and so forth. We're responsible, in other words. So no inevitability on the Christian growth. Chafer's focus in sanctification, remember this, his focus in sanctification is not human works, which would be the reform model. We said yesterday, reform, do works, get hot. They, they don't like Keswick because the Keswick people sit around on their Holy Spirit couch and wait for, for the moving. We, we work too, but we're not working in the flesh, and we make that vital, vital distinction. There are works re regenerate humans do, Ephesians 2.10, but 
They're not inevitable. And Ephesians 2.10 doesn't say they are. They're not mystical second deliverance through the, through the second person, through Jesus, like, like believe in Jesus all over again for the spirit or something. That's not the, the mystical sign. In fact, Schaefer would say, the spirit never reveals anything to me directly by direct communication. He says that. You read Schaefer, you think maybe he's mystical. He says, I don't receive direct communication. He never gives me evidence he's there, but he teaches me all the time, and I walk by the spirit. Rather, dependence upon the Holy Spirit to produce the fruit of righteous works and resist the temptation of the world, the flesh, and the devil. That is chafer and that's what makes us distinct let's pray our father we thank you for the filling of the spirit the work of the spirit in us for the filling of the spirit in schofield and chafer and uh our pastors that have uh, so faithfully looked to your scriptures and thank you for the, that they've taught us to to teach the word of god father we ask that you would uh, work these things in us that we would become better at uh, recognizing our responsibilities. Indeed, we are responsible, yet we are so incapable except the Spirit work in us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.